I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. Those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. If you've ever talked to a Christian in your entire life, you'll hear one word crop up over and over again, the word biblical. Popular Christian authors write about how to have a biblical marriage or a biblical business ethics or something. The word biblical signals a particular approach to the Bible that usually emphasizes conservative social and political values. In past episodes, Dean and I have taken a lot of cues from Christians who have worked at developing exactly the opposite. Instead of a biblical approach that emphasizes conservative social values, they have built what's called a materialist hermeneutic to the Bible. By materialist hermeneutic, I mean a way of understanding biblical narratives from the perspectives of economics, class, and power. A materialist hermeneutic to the Bible emphasizes unseating the powerful and the liberation of people. You know, not conservative values at all. For example, in the Gospel according to Matthew, there's a story of Jesus and the rich young ruler. If you've ever been to church, you're probably familiar with the story, but in case you're not, this is basically how it goes. A rich young ruler asks Jesus what he has to do to obtain eternal life. Jesus tells him that he should just follow the laws and the commandments. But Jesus goes on to add, if he wants to be perfect, he should sell all of his things and give the money to the poor. It's not unusual to hear that many Christians, especially biblical Christians, will interpret this story as not actually being about money or economics or even the poor, but instead it's about humbling yourself before God or submitting to Christ. There's probably something to be said about those two themes, I guess nothing wrong with them really, but also, reading the gospel without actually considering the material implications of what Jesus teaches is a good way to just protect one's own wealth and to continue to ignore the poor. There are certainly a lot of places we can think of biblical texts in more materialist ways. The Bible is, after all, a pretty big book. One of my friends and colleagues, Hannah Shanks, has been doing just that with regard to the roles and the actual bodies of women in the Bible. This past year, Hannah wrote a neat book called This Is My Body, Embracing the Messiness of Faith and Motherhood. Hannah's book helps us think through not just the material consequences of the Bible, but also the embodied consequences, too. To get into this more, I talked with Hannah about embodiment, Mary, and Advent. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, Henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the conceit of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has given help to Israel his servant, mindful of his mercy, even as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. You just heard my friend Hannah Shanks reading the Magnificat. The Magnificat is one of those good scripture passages that we get this time of the year, but I think sometimes we overlook how radical of a passage it actually is. That's not just some psalmist or other dude, but that's Mary. Mary, the mother of God. Mary, the 14-year-old caring Jesus. Mary, the girl who proclaims that God will tear the powerful down from their thrones. If you've been following the Twitter discourse this Advent season, you probably shouldn't, but if you have, you've seen some pretty hot takes on Mary. 
This time of the year, extremely online Christians of all varieties have something to say about Mary. While Catholics have their own particular takes on Mary, I've been a bit caught off guard by some of the Protestant opinions. For example, one Christian on Twitter even chastised Catholics who pray to Mary as, quote, necromancers. With all these bad takes about Mary floating around, I turned to my friend Hannah. She, unlike most Christians on Twitter, actually has a good take on Mary. Well, what does it mean then that Mary was pregnant and that God was an embryo and a fetus and a zygote, which is the best of the words for unborn babies? And it made me think, what about all the women who weren't Mary? What about all the people who maybe God asked, but they said no, so they didn't become the God bearer? What if God tried this before, but it did in a miscarriage or in other complications or problems? What if Mary wasn't the first? She was just only the first one to be able to get across the finish line, which doesn't, I think, diminish her, but really just kind of makes us think about the story and the implications. What if there were other people that God wanted to approach, but there was domestic violence in that household? And if that woman turned up pregnant from something other than her fiancé or husband would be violently beaten and so would not survive. All of that came around. And it just casts this kind of new light on both how I encountered the divine and how I encountered my own body and my own stories. The way Hannah talks about the story of Mary should give us all, Protestants and Catholics alike, pause to consider the embodied situation of Mary. This understanding of Mary makes her seem like more than just a Bible story, more than words on a page or a liturgy we say in church, but like a real flesh and blood human, someone who consented to give birth to God. For Hannah, reading Mary with his very flesh and blood understanding is an invitation for us to rethink our own bodies and our own experiences. So first, when I became pregnant, I just, uh, I just had a lot of questions. (laughs) Uh, I just had a lot of questions. Um, uh, I happened to learn that I was pregnant on a Sunday. And so I went to church and we took communion that Sunday. And many years before I had heard someone describe the act of communion as knitting the body and blood of Christ back together within ourselves, that that's kind of what the, the act we're doing. So I thought of that, that Sunday, the way that I always do every time I take communion. And then I was like, yeah, but like also you're knitting a person in your body right now, really, that's a, that, that is not metaphorical. That is not purely theological. That is material. I had, um, a kind of like suddenly difficult pregnancy where on Thanksgiving day, I stood up to go get some pie. I was seven months pregnant and suddenly found myself just bleeding, which you're really not supposed to do when you're seven months pregnant. Um, it's really bad. If you don't know how gestational bodies work, that's a bad thing. And so really quickly, I found myself in the car with my husband. We were two hours from the hospital where our, our care team was. And it's down Illinois 67, which is a really poorly patched <laughs> highway uh, in rural Illinois with not a lot of stops. And I was losing my mind. Um, as you might expect for someone who is in a medical emergency that involves two lives And I was just going through like, what would be comforting? And I thought, uh, I was like, what about Joshua? You love Joshua. And it's like, nope, don't need to fight a battle right now. Don't need Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. Don't need. And I went through this Rolodex of stories that the church had given me for times of difficulty. And none of them mattered because none of them fit. And then there was Mary who just a day, according to the gospel account, you know, went on this long journey while incredibly pregnant, got to a place that wasn't ideal and kind of suddenly had a baby that they weren't prepared for. And that was a story I desperately needed. So that changed a lot about how I view myself, how I view my son, how I view um, what it means to be an embodied person and what it means that God chose to be an embodied person as plan A. God chose to be an embodied person. And that seems like something we should pay attention to. We usually think about the incarnation the most at Christmas time. Christmas is great, but there's something right before it that we usually don't pay attention to as much. In the church calendar, we call this time leading up to Christmas, Advent. In churches that are less liturgical, Advent is a time that usually gets forgotten. 
The weeks leading up to Christmas are all about getting to the good stuff, that nice little baby Jesus. But if we're going to start paying attention to the embodied experience of Mary, and to others, we should slow down and reconsider how our churches worship in the pre-Christmas season. The church calendar has a time where we should be thinking about embodiment a little bit more built into it. Hannah reminds us that Advent is important because it's a time of waiting. It's a gestational period before Jesus comes. One would hope that Mary would become a very important player in Advent, but I think often she doesn't in a lot of churches, even the ones that observe Advent. Um, I think often make Mary a, a prop piece in the nativity as opposed to a actual player with agency and that she just becomes like part of the background in the baby Jesus story. And it's not, we don't hear a Mary story. We hear a baby Jesus story. In Advent, I think we frequently skip the actual last days of gestation (laughs) and birth of Jesus. We just want to get to like, Jesus is in the manger, all cleaned up. There's no afterbirth. The angels are singing. Somehow these donkeys are behaving. Like we're just going to skip right to that really happy part um, before doing the actual process of like, how did we get to there? How did we get to God making this decision that bodies are so important that I need to have one, that humans are so important that I need to dwell among them, which is one of the few distinctions that really does exist between the Christian God and other pantheons. Um, not that God was incarnate, but that God subjected God's self to the fullness of incarnation, including full dependency on the created, full dependency on what it means to be conceived and carried, and how fraught we know that process is, how frequently being carried ends in a miscarriage or, um, you know, a way that results in not a viable pregnancy. That's what God did, that that process was so important that we can't skip that part. Mm -hmm. But that's the exact part that we skip, I think, most of the time in most Christian observances of Advent. Not rushing through Advent, that gestational period, means having to really focus on Mary and what this time of waiting really means. At the top of this episode, Hannah read Mary's song, or the Magnificat. The Magnificat is a section of the gospel according to Luke, and duh, it's where this podcast gets its name. So, like Hannah said, we don't want Mary to just be a prop or a stand-in. We have to consider what she says and who she actually is and how we understand her theologically. The way I experience the Magnificat now, first, I think, to be very honest, like changes from year to year. And I think that's some of some of the point about why it's worthwhile to continue these practices is because we mature with them uh, and they take on new and deeper meanings over time. When I was a child, I remember just feeling really distant from Mary because first it was that she was a mom and I was like, not a mom. And then as I grew older, all of the messages about Mary targeted to people in my age group, junior high, high school, started really focusing on her chastity. Uh, And I remember just thinking like she became this amalgam of purity and obedience and deference and just this like really passive vessel was how she was portrayed. And that felt really distant to me also. And then once I grew older and became married and was not a virgin anymore, it was like, well, Mary and I have even less to talk about at a cocktail party now. Um, (laughs) There's just not a whole lot of common ground here because she was this sanitized inhuman superhero. Um, And then I reached a point in my life where I really needed a female body and a gestational body because of what it was like for me um, and my gestational experiences growing a human. And I found Mary and the Magnificat and her experience and her consent, which was really, really radical. So now when I hear the Magnificat, um, I really kind of lean into her boldness and proclamation where she says, you know, God has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid and behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. So she both acknowledges like, listen, I'm really nobody. Like I'm really just another, you know, like young Palestinian woman trying to survive 
She was in a very precarious state um, as a minor that she had not yet married. So all of her security at that time was still coming from her father. Her security would transfer um, to Joseph when they became married. And then the whole point of having sons at that time was that your sons would be your security in the future. So it's great um, but God didn't promise her security. God promised like through you, you know, you're going to have the savior. And so she says that that is a blessing. And that stands out to me too, because Mary would have known the risks of saying yes. Mary, I don't think was a fool, you know, had Joseph believed her without a dream? Probably not from what we see in the text. Um, and so she risked literally her current and future security She's not guaranteed anywhere in scripture that she'll survive the birth of the Holy Child. And Mary would have known the mortality rate of women birthing, which would be worse then than it is now. And it's still a dangerous act to undergo. She's too bold for her station, but she claims that boldness in God. She's too revolutionary for someone living in an occupied territory. She's too self-assured for a young woman who does not have any status or station. It all depends on others. She's too much, honestly. Um, but that too muchness is all based in just proclaiming the truth of her experience. Hannah's description of Mary and the Magnificat as too much seems just about right. There's definitely a revolutionary character to Mary's song. Taking the Magnificat out of context gives you a really good punk rock type of Christianity. You tear the mighty from their thrones. What could be better? However, taking the Magnificat in context through our embodied way of reading the Bible gives us something even more revolutionary. I definitely read the Magnificat as a revolutionary song and even a revolutionary act if we believe for a second that this was proclaimed in public, um, that you know, word would have gotten out. Certainly the sort of woman that it would take to compose a song like this, whether it was spontaneous or whether it was written or whether the community is, you know, imposing upon Mary this act of revolutionary, the woman behind it, wherever she is, would have to be someone for whom you could carry that. Someone for whom these words would come pouring out of your mouth or someone for whom the community could say, yep, yeah, that's Mary. Mary could do that. When I hear the Magnificat, I've been colored by a article written by a guy named Roger Wolsey, and its title is Jesus Mother Was a Punk, and it portrays Mary as the first punk rocker because of the the construction of the Magnificat and how um, anti-capitalist uh, one could read it, how anti-traditional hierarchical structures one could read it. Um, it doesn't really pull any punches. The fact that it's coming from the voice and throat of a woman, too. Again, whether you want to believe it as like literally what she said or placed in her mouth by the writers later who were recording, that in and of itself is revolutionary also. Because um, although in Jewish tradition we have these amazing songs of Hannah, of Deborah, of other foremothers, and it was, you know, of Miriam, of Zipporah um, during the Exodus, that uh, you would often get song of woman's name and they often have revolutionary acts. It's still definitely an undercurrent compared to, like you mentioned, the psalmist compared to all the d dudes in the Bible. Uh, so attributing it to her is also an upending of the traditional power structures. And I think because it's a revolutionary song, it really ought to make us tremble because we should consider on what end of the spectrum <laughs> that Mary is giving us do I fall? Am I someone who needs to be sent away empty? Or am I someone who needs to be filled with good things? And that's probably not a dichotomy. It's probably a sliding, like, multimodal scale for all of us. Um, but it does imply that what God has for us is not stuff, is not feasting, is not traditional power structures. It's something very, very different. And God doesn't really mind upending all of it. And that that is, in fact, if this is what we call a season of expectation, that should be what we expect from God, not something that we're surprised by. If we should expect this kind of upending of power from God, then how can we expect the powerful of the world to respond? Mary's song and the birth narrative of Jesus are only the first part of the Advent and Christmas story, and after that comes the beginning of the end for the powerful. Mary's song is, of course, from the Gospel of Luke, 
But in another gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, we hear about the response of the powerful to Jesus' birth. Herod, the king of Judea, wasn't as excited as we are about the birth of Jesus. Herod was king of a powder keg, is the way that I like to think about it. And then Pilate was like governor of Herod's powder keg. And we both, we see them later on in the gospels as well. What Mary does, what Jesus later continues, um, and the disciples throughout the gospels are very intentional messages that, um, no, actually Caesar isn't God. And no, actually, just because you say you're ruler of a place doesn't give you any true power. Um, again, you know, predominant beliefs at the time, if we read this in a historical context was, you know, the Romans were all about that. Like Caesar is a literal God person. Um, that's why they have divine right to rule. You got to follow it. If you don't like, you know, fire and fury, like the world has never seen upon your head. So to have Mary say, even that opener, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And then goes on to say that that is not a purely spiritual belief that to use your language, that's a material belief that has actual consequences. That means God is God. And no, you are not. There is something bigger than you. Uh, and that means also that you can be wrong and fallible and terrible, which we all know you are because you oppress us on the regular. I think two things we could probably, if we look at Herod and try to imagine what that could feel like, and we try to be honest, uh, it could be a dismissal, right? Um, of just like making her a mockery, calling her a slut, like whatever else you want to do to discredit her. But instead we see a different response from Herod, which I think is really interesting in that Herod takes it totally seriously and takes action, pretty drastic action. Um, or plans to is what the gospel tells us. I think like if I were going to write a story like this, I would be like, man, why would this king be threatened by this like poor lady, this poor pregnant by questionable means lady? That seems like a massive overreaction. Now, what we know from Herod of history is that he actually was kind of prone to massive overreaction. So maybe, but if I were just going to write a story like this, it'd be like, no, you would discredit her. You would try to turn her own inner systems against her and this would all get squashed before it ever got started and instead it's like oh dang we have to do something about this because this is going to cite insurrection and so either it's that mary herself was enough of a threat or that the jewish community at the time in you know herod's territory was such a powder keg that no whisper of an alternate reality could be tolerated When we read the gospel as truly good news, we should read it as an alternate reality. When we, as Hannah has reminded us to do, think through what Mary is saying from the perspective of an actual person, a mother and a young woman, we get a glimpse into that other reality. This embodied perspective gives us a better understanding of what the kingdom of God is like, and the type of politics that Christians should actually concern themselves with. In Ernesto Cardinal's book, The Gospel and Sol Antename, he records the conversations he had during church with farmers in Nicaragua, before the Nicaraguan Revolution. One of the most striking conversations he archives is their thoughts on Mary's song. After reading it, he records the following conversation. Someone says, If God is against the mighty, then he has to be on the side of the poor. Andrea, the wife of one of the farmers, says, That promise that the poor would have those good things, was it for then, for Mary's time, or would it be in our time? I asked because I don't know. One of the young people answered. She spoke for the future, it seems to me, because we are just barely beginning to see the liberation she announces. As you read the Magnificat this Advent and Christmas season, think about Mary as a real person, as someone who is too bold, too revolutionary, and just too much. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. 